The Wheel of Time weaves the great pattern as it wills. It's my job to unravel it. Welcome back to Unraveling the Pattern. I'm Lauren, and in this video I'll unravel everything I found in the Wheel of Time Season 1 Episode 6, The Flame of Tarvalon. This is not a review, this is a deep dive for new fans of the show and for longtime fans of the books. This video contains full story spoilers for the first six episodes of Season 1 of the Wheel of Time TV show, as well as any information that's been revealed through bonus content or general trivia on the Amazon Prime Video app, but you don't have to have read the Wheel of Time books to watch this. I'll also be discussing some minor world building background information that will help to explain some of the things that are not clear in the show. As always, if you wish to remain 100% spoiler free and to only learn about the Wheel of Time as it's presented in the TV show, this video might not be for you. Just before entering the ways near the end of the episode, Moraine tells the group, there's no turning back. Whatever happens now is beyond our control. Then she says this iconic line from the books. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills. But what exactly does this mean? In episode 4, Moraine tells Loghain, the wheel doesn't want anything. It can't. Any more than a river or the rain can want something. It's people who want. This implies that the wheel is not sentient, but like the earth or nature, it just is. But then how does the wheel have a will? Earlier in this episode, Swan Sanche, in a much simpler, more humble dress than her pompous, ceremonial Amarlin seat clothing, says to Nynaeve and Egwene, The wheel does not care if you are young or afraid, petty or weak. It certainly doesn't care what you want. The wheel calls you to this, whether you can bear it or not. The last battle is coming. What any of us wants now is meaningless. The only thing that matters is what you do. So the wheel doesn't want anything, but it also weaves as it wills, and it calls people to greatness. And according to Moraine, whatever happens next is beyond their control. And yet the only thing that matters, according to Swan, is what you do. This paradoxical duality of the wheel and the concepts of free will versus predestination is another major theme of Robert Jordan's masterful work. To better grasp this, you have to understand not just the Wheel of Time, but the great pattern that it weaves and how it functions. I've created several videos about these topics, including a spoiler light animated deep dive all about the wheel and the pattern, with a ton of quotes from Robert Jordan, the creator of the books. I've also made a few smaller Watt 101 videos for new fans that help to clarify many of these topics. Be sure to check them out. Here are the basics. The Wheel of Time is not sentient, meaning it can't feel. According to the books, the creator is good, the dark one is evil, but the wheel of time is neither. It weaves both good and evil into the great pattern of the ages and aims for balance. The threads from which the pattern is woven are the lives, events, and things that make up all of reality. Robert Jordan said, the wheel is more than a simple mechanism. We are not talking about something as simple as a spinning wheel at all. We are talking something more along the lines of the most complex computer you could possibly imagine. So if the wheel can't feel or want, but it does control the events of the world to some degree and aims for balance, what of free will? Certainly individuals within the world of the Wheel of Time are limited by their actions, because if they stray too far from the pattern, the wheel can force certain corrections to keep balance. But this doesn't mean that there isn't room for change or choice, so long as it doesn't disturb the grand plan, so to speak. In the books, this is explained in detail by Loyal to Rand when he meets him in the library for the first time. Loyal is my favorite character in the books, in part because he often talks for pages and pages about the lore and the metaphysics of the wheel. He's one of the main sources of exposition in the story. Loyal says, The wheel of time weaves the pattern of the ages, and the threads it uses are lives. It is not fixed, the pattern, not always. If a man tries to change the direction of his life, and the pattern has room for it, the wheel just weaves on and takes it in. There is always room for small changes, but sometimes the pattern simply won't accept a big change, no matter how hard you try. Swan discusses this concept to a degree with Nynaeve and Egwene. Nynaeve wants no part in the Aes Sedai schemes, but Swan implies that it's not Nynaeve's choice. She says, I know what it is to feel you deserve something different than what this life gives you, to wonder why you couldn't just stay home, love the people you love, grow old with them, protect them, support them, threads weaving in and out of the pattern without consequence. But the truth is, the two of you have been called to greatness. Certainly Swan understands better than most what it means to sacrifice her desires to follow the calling to greatness by the wheel. She could just have easily been talking to a younger version of herself and Moraine when she said, the two of you have been called to greatness. William Shakespeare said that some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. You could even argue that Swan is all three. While Swan had the ability to channel inborn and was technically born great, she used it for simple things like untying fishing knots and helping her father with mundane tasks. Unfortunately, Swan lived in the nation of Tyr. The online trivia for this scene says, channeling 
Lying is illegal in Tyr. Aes Sedai are tolerated and even respected, but they're expected not to use the One Power while in the country. When a girl discovers she can channel, she's forced to leave that same day and encouraged to never return. Did you catch the sound of dogs barking in the background when Swan channeled? Somebody was most certainly watching. That same somebody must have burned down her father's fishing hut and left the Dragon's Fang mark there. When someone scrawls the Dragon's Fang on another's property, it's sort of like a hate crime within the world of the Wheel of Time. It's considered to be a sort of warning of evil, but often it says more about the person who scrawled it than the victim. Though none of this was in the books, I really like this cold open where we learned of Swan's past. A few other tangential details that I noticed in this scene. I like the subtle blue color she's wearing to signify which Aja she will one day join. Also, if you look on the map in the Amazon Explore page, it shows her fishing hut, and it's labeled the Kingdom of Tyr. This is odd because in the books, Tyr doesn't have a king. Anyway, Dana, the dark friend from episode 3, told Ran that she wanted to see the world, and she mentioned one day seeing the Stone of Tyr. Did you notice this massive, almost mountain-sized palace or fortress in the background of some of these shots? That's very likely the Stone of Tyr. Finally, according to the Amazon X-Ray trivia, the tattoos on Swan's chest and body represent her culture and tell the stories of her life. Not only was Swan born with the ability to channel, or with greatness, but when she was cast out, she had to make her way to the White Tower on her own. In a way, greatness was thrust upon her. As she said to the girl, she could not just stay home or love who she wanted to. She answered the call of the wheel. Eventually, Swan and Moraine met as novices in the tower, and they became very close. After a series of so far unexplained events, they eventually witnessed a powerful foretelling or prophecy from an Aes Sedai named Gitara Moroso at the moment of the dragon's rebirth. According to the Amazon trivia, the foretelling was so powerful and shocking that the sister died, leaving Moraine and Swan to decide what to do. In this moment, greatness was once again thrust upon Swan and Moraine. We don't know exactly what transpired after this, but they've been searching for the dragon born for the last 20 years. During that time, Swan achieved greatness, and though she started in humble beginnings, she eventually became the most powerful person in the world, the Amarlin Seat. It's said that the Amarlin Seat is able to summon any king or queen to her, and even if they do not support the Aes Sedai, they will come. This is why there is such a shock when Leandrin tries to challenge or talk back to Swan in the Hall of the Tower. The trivia says, Mentioning an Amarlin's previous Aja in public is considered discourteous and insulting. An Amarlin is to be of all Ajas and none. To bring up her original chosen Aja is to challenge her impartiality. Did you notice that Swan's Great Serpent Ring had a golden colored jewel? And she had subtle stripes of the seven Ajas on the collar of her dress. In the books, the Amarlin wears a stole with the seven colors of the Ajas. Later, to prove just how powerful Swan is, she says, This is my tower, my city, my world, from Tyr to the two rivers and every town between. Remember that while you are here. Moraine's face during these scenes, a mixture of awe and love and wonder, was pretty much exactly how I was feeling whenever Sophie Okaneda was in the scene. She absolutely played Swan to perfection. A few other minor details I noticed in these Hall of the Tower scenes. Did you see the little Flame of Tarvalon symbol engraved in the Amarlin seat? Or the seven spoked wheels that represent the seven Ajas and the seven ages of the Wheel of Time? I'm assuming the green and red Ajas are closer to the Amarlin because they're likely the two largest and most oppositional Ajas. This is why everyone was shocked when Alana, a green, sided with Leandrin, a red. It seemed to me that Moraine quickly changed her tactic at this moment and also decided to support Leandrin's side. Not that it did her any good. Each of the seven Ajas in the tower has a different purpose. From the general trivia, the animated short, and through dialogue in these past episodes, we know that the green Aja is the battle Aja. They typically love men and have more than one warder. The reds typically dislike men and never take on warders. But this makes me wonder, who is the man in North Harbor that Moraine threatened to reveal in order to blackmail Leandrin? Does Leandrin have a male lover or a warder, or is she hiding a man who can channel? Moraine said that if Leandrin's red sisters find out, we both know what they'll do to him. I'm looking forward to finding out more. We also learn that the Reds are like the police, who make sure that men who can channel are hunted down and gentled, and they also enforce the laws of the tower. The Brown Aja focuses on research and knowledge. The Grey Aja are mediators and deal in politics and diplomacy. The White Aja is for women dedicated to philosophy, logic, and truth. The Yellows are known for healing and seem to be on good terms with the Blues. The Blue Aja, according to Leandrin, are spies and are meant to protect and warn the world and the Tower of Threats. Each Aja has three representatives called Sitters who sit in judgment and counsel with the Amarlin seat in the Hall of the Tower. 
Each Aja also has a leader or head of that Aja. My guess is that the middle seat is for the leader of each Aja. Maigon, the blue sister who sits in the middle here, commanded Moraine to stay in the tower, and Moraine told Swan later that the only way she could go against that command was for the Amerlin, who supersedes the Aja leader's power, to exile her. Did you notice that the middle seat of the green Aja was missing in Aes Sedai? This is very likely Karene's seat. She's the green Aes Sedai who was killed by Loghain. Another minor tangent. I don't think that Loghain is actually as hateful as he came across in this opening scene. I think he was really trying to anger Swan so that she would sentence him to death. The tragedy of being a man who can channel is that if he keeps channeling, he'll eventually go mad and destroy everyone he loves. But if he is gentle, he'll lose the will to live and beg for death. By the way, Swan mentions to Moraine in this scene that if the other Aes Sedai find out about what they've been doing for the past 20 years, they'll be stilled. The term stilled or stilling is the female equivalent of being gentled or gentling. Though female channelers do not go mad with the One Power, if they are stilled or have the ability to channel removed as Loghain did, they also will lose the will to live and will likely beg for death. This is why Swan and Moraine have been keeping their secrets for so many years. Okay, back to the concept of free will. Most people are just threads weaving in and out of the pattern without consequence, as Swan puts it. But for a very select few, the wheel calls some to greatness. Back to the library scene in the first book, Loyal says to Rand, but sometimes the change chooses you, or the wheel chooses it for you. And sometimes the wheel bends a life thread, or several threads, in such a way that all the surrounding threads are forced to swirl around it. And those force other threads, and those still others, and on and on. That first bend to make the web, that is Taviran, and there is nothing you can do to change it, not until the pattern itself changes. This goes on for several more paragraphs, but you get the idea. Because people within the world of the wheel can make choices to a certain degree, this can affect the predetermined pattern of an age, and it can cause the great pattern to sometimes drift off course from the intended plan. If the pattern drifts too far, there are protective mechanisms put in place to correct it. This is called Taviran. When the pattern needs certain things to happen or change, special people, called Taviran, are born or spun out by the pattern. These Taviran are like anchor point threads in the pattern and have the ability to influence the world and the people around them. They can literally shape and change the weaving of the threads or the destiny of the pattern's web, which keeps the pattern of an age on course and keeps the great pattern of all of the ages running smoothly. As Loyal said, these Taviran often have less freedom of choice as they're tools of the pattern. In the first episode, Moraine says to Lan that there are rumors of four Taviran in the Two Rivers. We still aren't sure in the show which four of the five characters from the Two Rivers are Taviran, but it seems pretty clear that some major changes are happening to these individuals and that these people are causing ripple effects all across the pattern. If one of these people is the Dragon Reborn, he or she will have the potential to either correct the sins of the previous dragon and defeat the Dark One, or if the Dragon Reborn joins the Dark One, as Moraine said, the Earth itself will Will burn, and when a new age comes, it will be built upon the ashes of the places and people we love. Even worse, if the Dark One manages to get these powerful Taviran on his side, the entire pattern could unravel and reality could cease to exist. Did you see what I did there? Moraine even mentions that the prophecies of the Dragon Reborn are different in every culture, and that those kept by the Aes Sedai have been translated hundreds of times, so it's impossible to know for certain who or what the Dragon Reborn will be. She even mentions the idea that there could be a many-headed dragon, and Swan says, The last dragon was one man. Why would the wheels bit the dragon sold into many? Could all five of the Two Rivers villagers somehow be the Dragon Reborn? Maybe like the Megazord from Power Rangers, they're stronger together than apart. Let's once again examine each character and how the wheel has turned their lives upside down and how they could potentially be the Dragon Reborn. Egwene is strong and unbreakable. She's learned to go with the flow of the river and the pattern's influence. She also has a strong sense of right and wrong, and she's loyal and respectful. I love this little moment when she bows to Swan and Nynaeve stubbornly refuses. When Swan says, the last battle is coming, what any of us wants now is meaningless. The only thing that matters is what you do. Egwene immediately follows with, So what do we need to do? Egwene is a fast learner and has the potential to become a very powerful channeler, but her potential is nothing compared to Nynaeve's. I love this moment when Swan says, I've been told you're the most powerful channeler we've seen in a thousand years, and Egwene beams with pride until Swan then says, Nynaeve Almira. The look she gives Nynaeve is great, both of surprise and then wonder. Nynaeve's raw strength in the One Power caused Loghain to stop channeling and to look upon her in awe, and Moraine claims that Loghain was powerful enough to kill all of the sisters that had captured him. He almost got away with it too if it hadn't been for that meddling braid tugger, Nynaeve Almira. 
The dragon is said to be the most powerful channeler to ever live. But Nynaeve has that two rivers stubborn as a mule attitude. What will become of her? So far, despite her teachings to Egwene, Nynaeve seemed to take her own path. She took the initiative to leave the two rivers and to track her friends. So far, unlike the others, Nynaeve seems like she has mostly chosen where she goes and what she does. Will Nynaeve learn to give in to the currents of the river and to go with the flow of the pattern? Or will she constantly fight against it? We don't know much about Rand, Matt, or Perrin just yet. We know that Rand has red hair that's supposedly very rare and only comes from the Aiel, a strange culture of warriors that live far away to the east. Though Mygon did mention that more Aiel are being spotted on this side of the spine of the world. Side note, she also mentioned that she'll be investigating ships that have been disappearing in the west. This will definitely be important later. Back to Rand. We know that Rand is loving and committed to Egwene and to all of his friends. He has a strange sword with a heron on it that he got from his father before he left the two rivers. He also shares terrifying dreams of the man with the eyes of embers with his other friends. Rand recognized the large mountain next to Tarvalon. Rand also saw the darkness that Moraine pulled away from Matt. It's likely that Lan and Matt saw it too, but what if Rand was the only one to see it? Speaking of the darkness in Matt, Moraine says that Matt is stronger than he has any right to be, and the general trivia says that Matt's possible Taviran nature kept him protected from allowing the evil of the Shatter Logoth dagger to fully take hold. Was Matt somehow guided by the pattern to take the dagger in the first place? What became of the dagger after Moraine healed Matt of its influence? What did Lan do with it? Moraine claims that she healed Matt of his connection with the dagger, but that it fed off of the darkness in him as much as he fed off of the darkness of the dagger. She says that if Matt touches the dagger again, he may be lost forever. Could this be why Matt chose to stay back? Was he still being influenced or pulled towards the dagger in some way? Perhaps we'll see him meet Padam Fane and Tarvalon later. To be clear, I don't think this scene with Matt staying behind was actually in the original script or the plan for the first season. In the books, Matt definitely goes with the group into the ways. However, for reasons that we still don't know, the actor who plays Matt, Barney Harris, left the show after filming of this episode during pandemic-related shutdowns, and as far as we know, he didn't return for the last two episodes of the season, so we think he was written out of the last two episodes. Matt has been recast and will be portrayed by Donald Finn in season two of the Wheel of Time TV show. To me, this scene has the feeling of being recut and strangely edited to make up for him never returning. I look forward to Donald Finn's portrayal of Matt next season. Perrin, for the most part, has been pretty quiet in the show, but he's gone through some of the most interesting changes. He accidentally killed his wife and has to deal with that grief. He's in a sort of existential internal battle related to acts of violence and the pacifist ideologies of the Way of the Leaf. He has a strange connection with wolves, and Egwene seems to think that he was somehow communicating with them. His eyes turn golden yellow like a wolf, and he also shares strange dreams of the ember-eyed specter. Perrin was tortured by the White Cloaks, which I'm sure will cause some mental scarring, as Egwene suggested. I think in part, the show has chosen to minimize the backstory and influence of the young men and women of the Two Rivers, because they're trying to tell the story of the first book from Moraine's perspective, and they want to keep the mystery of the Dragon Reborn a secret from the general audience. Many fans of the books have felt that the show has veered too far from the source material in order to mask the identity of the Dragon Reborn, and to keep Moraine at the forefront of the show. I like the focus of the show for the most part, but I do wonder when we'll start to see more development of the cast of young characters. Speaking of Moraine, this episode was certainly focused on her and Swan's complicated relationship. I like this little detail, where Moraine masked her bond with Lan temporarily before she met up with Swan, so that he would not feel what they did. Were you surprised when it was revealed that Swan and Moraine were secret lovers? Some fans of the books are having a hard time with this, but the books are very clear that Moraine and Swan, in their early years, did have a romantic and even a sexual relationship. I personally like this focus in the show, as it's more realistic than some of the other forced romantic relationships from the books. To me, the most controversial thing about this secret relationship between Moraine and Swan, or Swarain as fans are calling it, is the strange paintings in their rooms that reveal the doorway that appeared to lead to a fishing hut in Tyr. I can understand why this could be especially confusing for people who have not read the books. Without spoiling too much, I'll just read what the extras say about this on the official Amazon Prime Explore page. Terre Angrial are physical objects of varying sizes that can be used to focus the One Power in a variety of ways. The Oath Rod, upon which all Aes Sedai take the three oaths, uses the One Power to make the vows sworn upon it unbreakable. 
Others can act as doorways between places or seem to have no function at all. The general trivia clarifies this a bit more. It says that some of these objects do very mundane things like play music or create fabric, while others act as doorways to different places, spaces, or experiences. So without spoiling too much, I think it's important to note that Moraine and Swan can't just open this doorway from anywhere to see each other. They have to have these Terangrial paintings, which are embedded into the walls of their rooms. Did you see the similar painting in Swan's room? I'm I'm also guessing that the space in which they rendezvoused was not actually in Tyr. It appeared to match the fishing hut set that was Swan's home as a child, but that was burned to the ground. I'm guessing she never returned, and that this was sort of like a holodeck kind of experience that you see in Star Trek, based on Swan's memories. But I'll leave it at that for now. Perhaps we'll return to this in a future video. The other confusing thing about this is that we see another type of magical doorway at the end of the episode. This is actually very different from the doorway that Moraine used in her chambers. This is called a waygate, and it has a very complex backstory that seems to have been changed quite a bit from the books. I assume that we'll learn more about the nature of the ways and the waygate in the next episode, so I'll save an explanation about this for later. But I wanted to point out one thing. Did you notice that Moraine's threads of power were shaped like a trefoil leaf or a leaf with three points? This has some significance that I'll save for another time. Speaking of objects of the one power, we know that the oath rod is binding and that any oath made on it can't be broken. In order to avoid Mygon's command to stay in the tower, Moraine tells Swan that when she punishes her, she'll need to be exiled. Also, Swan has been having recurring dreams and seems to think that the Dark One is in a weakened state and that Moraine needs to take the Two Rivers villagers to a place called the Eye of the World to stop the Dark One at his prison for good. Are we sure we can trust Swan's dreams? After all, we've seen a dark influence in the dreams of others throughout the season. Are they being led into a trap? Anyway, Swan doesn't just exile Moraine, but she forces her to swear a new fourth oath on the Oath Rod. On first watch, this scene was a bit odd because Moraine is already bound by the oath to speak the truth. So she could have just been forced to say that she'll obey the Armalan Sea, and her oath to speak the truth would require her to obey. Also, without giving away too many spoilers, the concept of the Armalan forcing others to swear fealty to her on the Oath Rod is highly controversial, and I don't think it's something that Swan's character would ever do. That being said, when you look at this scene from a slightly different perspective, to me it has a much deeper meaning that's a perfect example of Swan and Moraine following the will of the wheel, while also achieving their own greatness and making their own choices. When you rewatch watch this scene, rather than thinking of it as a punishment and a show of power by the Amarlin, instead consider it as a defiant act of two people who deeply care for each other and want to commit to each other on a deeper level, like a marriage. Swan says that her position as Amarlin is no life. She's allowed no love of her own, nothing but the seat. Moraine then asks, when have we ever followed the rules? In the behind the scenes feature, they compare this scandalous relationship between Moraine and Swan to somebody having a secret romantic relationship with the Pope. Think of the danger they're in just for having this relationship. And despite this, knowing that they may realistically never see each other again, Moraine changes the words of the oath from swearing fealty to the Amarlin, and she instead swears fealty to the person, Swan Sanche. Then she repeats the words of Swan's father from the opening scene, under her breath calling her daughter of the river, clever as a pike, strong as the tides. To me, this is like a wedding vow that shows just how deeply Swan and Moraine care for each other. Perhaps the wheel does weave as it wills, and doesn't often care about what people want, but in this moment, Moraine and Swan chose their own path and committed to each other in an unbreakable vow. When Moraine walked away, I doubt she was concerned about the sisters of the Aes Sedai who turned their backs on her. She was probably only concerned that she might truly never see Swan Sanche again in this life. She doesn't know what awaits her and the villagers at the Eye of the World, but Moraine has always been willing to put herself in danger to save the world, to sacrifice her own needs for the greater good. She even said she would kill the dragon before she would let the Dark One have him or her. Whatever happens now, there's no turning back. Please consider supporting me on Patreon or join here on YouTube like these awesome people. Don't forget to like the video and to subscribe and to check out my other spoiler-free deep dives and Watt 101 videos as well. Thanks for watching.